Welcome to Gladiator School. What's happening, everybody? You're tuned in to another episode of Off the Yard. Um, I'm Big Lance. Much love to the Gladiator Gang. Salute to the Blue Collar Kings. And as always, it's two L's and a bulletproof R, baby. So, last video was about the rules of engagement. And a lot of people in the comments saying, well, that's not really what the rules of engagement mean, or you got the terminology wrong. You know, maybe I did. But, uh, hey, man, I get an A for effort, right? That being said, we're moving on to the next segment of our series, which is preparation. Now, when people talk about preparation, they think about, oh, man, we got to get knives and we got to get this, we got that. But there's a lot of aspects of preparation that are not really discussed that much. And today we're going to touch on it. So, first and foremost, with any organization, whether it's a religious organization, faction in prison, or whether it's a gang, or whether it's just a group of guys, you're going to have somebody there that is, quote unquote, your sergeant of arms. Basically, your sergeant of arms has one job and one job only. That's to be war ready, prepared at all times. You should always have some stash of weapons somewhere on the yard, in the building, or any place that it could pop off. That being said, we had two sergeant of arms. And the reason we had that was because in my, at this particular prison I'm going to talk about, which is Greensville, um, is a very large prison. So we had a, two units, one unit on one side, one unit on the other side. Now what would happen is sometimes they would move us around and you would get put in a different uh, pod or building and you would have those units having to somehow or some way collaborate with one another to make sure that the whole organization ran smoothly for one, but also was prepared if something jumped off. Now, the best place that I always found to hide any type of metal shank or anything like that would be a weight pile. Because when they ran the metal detectors, there's nothing but metal. So what we would do is on bench presses such as this one, or a leg machine or like a Smith squat machine, we would pop the caps off or go inside of where the pegs go for the different um, levels of weight and we would stash knives in there. Um, they had mats on the ground. Sometimes we'd not just lift the mat and put it underneath, but we would cut, slice inside the mat and hide a flatter blade. Now, there's many different things that you can make a weapon out of, guys. You can make a weapon, like I said, out of styrofoam cups. Heat and cool, heat and cool, heat and cool. You can make a weapon out of toilet paper. If you take a toilet paper roll, right, and you harden it with water, or I would use coffee creamer. Uh, coffee creamer, powdered coffee creamer, acts like a starch when it is used on, we used them on handkerchiefs to draw. We would starch the handkerchief, lay it out flat, let it dry, and it would be hard, like cardboard. So it gave me the idea, well, let me try it on toilet paper. So what I did was I pulled the roll out. I would flatten the, the paper aspect of it, creamer, Stir, creamer, wet, let it dry, keep doing this process. Now, is it really worth all the trouble to make a toilet paper knife? If that's your only option, then yes, it is. But in a prison penitentiary environment, there's plenty of metal running or falling off of everything. Most of these prisons are old. And so what would happen is, uh, as, as these prisons age and the metal rusts and things break and things like that, we would kick off shelving, we would break off any piece of metal we could find, whether it be from a door, a table, an old chair, whatever, man, we're going to find some way to use it. Um, that being said, my favorite weapon that I ever had was made from, at Greensville, it was an older prison, so you had your top bunk and your bottom bunk. Underneath of it, you would have these two shelves, and they were originally meant to keep papers and books and personal items in there, but over time... We had learned you could kick those damn things off and make bone crushers. I had about an eight inch bone crusher that I had for a very long time, and that was my baby. It would, it would, it would, it would take your head off. Um, I only really had to use it, quote unquote, once, and it wasn't in use of like I just pulled it out. 
Um, I didn't use it on anybody. I have been in altercations where I've used a knife, but it was more of a poker. Now you have pokers, you have bangers, then you have bone crushers, right? And like I spoke before, the bone crusher is going to break bones on the way in. It's a thick piece of metal. It's sharp. It's heavy. It's massive. It's Braveheart. <laughs> so after all that being said, blah, blah, blah. Now here's a, here's a part that we need to talk about as well as far as preparation goes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got all the weapons in the world. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We got all the guys. We're ready to fight. Boom, boom, boom. But here's the problem. When you are getting ready to go to war with another organization, what happens is you know going into it what's going to be the repercussions of it. Yeah, you're going to go to the hole. Yeah, you're going to get charges. Yeah, you're going to get slammed down for probably a few months at least. But the facility itself is going to be shut down as well. Now, this causes a problem when you are dealing with money and revenue and things like that. So before you end up going to war, what you're going to end up doing is politicking. Everybody wants to find a reason not to fight most of the time, especially if you're a leader. You don't want to fight. You don't want to, you don't want to lose the revenue you've got on the yard. You don't want to cause a problem with another organization because y'all popped it off in the dorm or in the pod or in the yard, got the whole facility locked down, and this guy was supposed to go over to visit next week and get 350 suboxone. It shuts down movement. When the facility gets locked down, it shuts down movement. Nobody's going to be able to move around except for maybe the, 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 the chow hall guys. They're going to call kitchen guys to come make food because those CEOs are too lazy to cook food themselves and actually do any real work. So they're going to call them to go over there. They're going to cook. They're going to have people passing out trays. Now, the best chance you got of receiving anything when you're on a whole facility lockdown is one of those guys. And you've got to really play to the cup because as they're passing trays, throughout the doors, running down the cell block, that CO is literally right behind them, watching every move they make. Preparation. You go speak to other organizations. You know, you might have allies that you roll with. Say, I'm, I was DMI. Here is, I, we had ties with MS. We had ties at times with certain blood factions here in Virginia. Not in Maryland. That's much different. Now, with preparation also comes the other side of the fence, and that is the officers and the administration. They are all the time prepared. They have a unit called SRT or TAC or Goon Squad or whatever different states call these guys, but it is an elite unit, as they would say, of officers who are trained uh, to uh, do cell extractions, to be there in case of a riot. Now, think about just the visual aspect of this, guys. And I know it's hard to envision. I know a lot of you have seen the um, the, the videos on Pelican Bay and uh, the shoe and how people set it off and San Quentin and all that. But it's nothing like being there when it really pops off and you have 40 to 50 guys rumbling, stabbing, fighting, cutting, screaming. The sound that most grown men make when they feel a knife go inside of their body is something that you don't forget. You don't forget the sound it makes when it goes in and when it comes out. You don't forget the sound it makes when they've got a guy on the ground and they're hitting him so hard with one of these bone crushers that it's going into their chest cavity, breaking through the plate going into their body, through their vital organs, out their spine, and into the floor. And you literally hear it. Because it's hitting the floor. I've seen guys hit guys so hard with these bone crushers that the ends, the tips would flatten. Just, I mean, they're not poking, they're not poking at you. These are 200 plus pound grown, strong, Gorilla men wielding a six inch knife into your body. And a lot of times, especially if you are a small organization, you are outnumbered, you're not fighting one guy. You're fighting three, four at a time. 
I need people to understand this. I need people to understand that there is no real preparation. There's preparation to the, to the point of materials, but there's no preparation for your mind until you are actually in this, in this thick of it. And you know that if you if you make a, a wrong move or you swing and miss or or you grab and or you're this that 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 could be the last thing you do. Now the police, what they have with the cops, what they're gonna have is they're gonna have riot gear, full on gas. They have OC spray. They have shields that are electrocute. They will electrocute you. So when we were in us in the shoe program, I was in, well, I was in a, a level five supermax for a couple of years. And uh, we would flood. There wasn't much we could do. We're in a box behind a door. We're slammed down, bro. 23 and 1. For real. Just like Death Channel. Shout out to Death. Uh, 23 and 1. Uh, not coming out. You're not really wrecking real hard. You, you come out to like maybe heat up some shit. If you ain't got a stinger. Which I'm going to show you how to make a stinger. Um, to heat your water up. But you're running to the microwaves. You're running to the phones. Nobody really wants to really get down too bad with each other. Because... The only little bit of freedom you got, they'll take from you for six months to a year at the drop of a dime. So what they did was we would flood and they got tired of us flooding. So what they ended up doing is, I remember me and my cellie, I've told the story on it, but there's a lot of new people. And real quick, I want to shout out to all the new Gladiator gang members. Thank you for tuning in and showing support and love to the channel. I love you guys and I can't do any of this without you guys, man. You all make it possible. So what they did was they waited till we flooded the whole top tier, guys. And it was literally cascading off of the top tier. <laughs> I mean, just... Psh, I heard them. They were coming with this, this funky-ass march, man. Dude, whose house is this? This is our house. Who runs this house? We run this house. You can hear them coming down. So they get into the building, and they had this big, big, ginormous human being... <laughs> And he's got this shield. I didn't, I'd i never seen the shield, bro. I've been in the chair. I've been zapped. I've had the helmet with the net. I've had all that stuff. But this was a new monster. This is a new animal. So they pop. They come to the trace site. They pop the trace site. And they're like, both of y'all on your knees. Turn around. Hands behind your head. We're like, F that. We're not doing none of that stuff, bro. We're bucking. We're flooding. I'm kicking water as I'm talking to them. I'm taking a, a book. And I'm, a hard book. I'm sliding, pushing water out the door. 23, <laughs> whatever my cell number was at the time. And they came running in. Now, when they come in as a CERT team, what an assert is special response team. Um, and me being STG, they're coming every every time with a CERT team. STG means security threat group. I was the leader of an STG, a security threat group. Um, each one of those guys, when they come through that door, has got a designated part of your body that they're going for. This guy's going to have your right arm. This guy's going to have your left arm. These guys going to have your feet. This guy's going to have your torso. Well, when they came in, guys, that man with that shield was front of the line. And he hit me, zap. And I'm standing in that water. And they fucking, they're, they're, they're electrocuting me. I hit the ground. And he just laying on top of me with a big grin on his face. Shocked me so much. I literally lost control. And it's all bad. They are prepared. That's preparation. They're ready for war at all times. Now, there's been a lot of incidents where the prison will riot and the inmates will take over. But how far do they really think they're going to get? They kill a few chomos. They might do this to some rats. Or they might kill a few COs. But at the end of the day, you never made it out the gates, bro. You're not getting out of those gates. No matter what you do. As far as going back now to inmate on inmate preparation, you're going to have to, one, have your artillery, your weaponry ready. Every man should have a blade. And when it's popping off and when it's really getting tense, you will see a lot of men that it'll be 90 degrees outside, man. Most dudes get their shirts off. You'll see a group of guys with jackets on. The reason they have jackets on is because they have stuffing or magazines or books or dirt or whatever they can find, and they've laced the insides of those jackets so they're not going to get stabbed to death in their 
liver and kidneys and stomach and, and heart. They, they, all this stuff is padded. Now, like I said before, war is expensive. War is costly on all ends of the, of the board. Yeah, and there's been times where I've only had 20 or 30 guys on a yard, but that's 20 or 30 men. You're going to have to bring that plus some. So you lose two. What are we going to do? How can we resolve it? How can we finish this off without doing going to war? We might sit down and politic. We might sit down for days and politic until we come up with a resolution. And I can sit here and show you how to make all types of different knives and shanks and all that. But there's hundreds of videos on YouTube about doing that. And plus, honestly, I don't want to be a part of showing these youngsters how to do that. I want to be a part of the solution. The one that says, man, you know what? I don't want to go to prison. Man. I remember watching that dude, Big Lance, talk about this shit. And it was not, it was all bad. Because it is. It's all bad. There's nothing good about prison. People, you know, come and tell these funny stories. And yes, man, there are moments when we are laughing and joking and things like that. But at the end of the day, it's still prison. At the end of the night, when the door shut behind you and all you're left with is your thoughts, your feelings, and your emotions, it's the saddest part of your life. Prison is one of those places where you put a lot of distractions in your, in your day because you don't want to think about where you're at. That's why we always say, man, I lived on a routine. Yeah, it was a routine. It was a distraction, dog. I might work out twice a day. I might read for an hour or two a day. Da -da -da -da. I'm distracting myself from the inevitable reality that I am in prison for a very long time. 14 years of my life in prison. Gone. Cannot get back. I'm 44 years old. I'll be 44 in a week. And I have spent half my life in prison. Bad decisions, man. I wasn't using the, the, the God-given gifts that I have to function out here. I'm talking about preparation in the prison. But you know what? It really starts with preparation out here. You have to be prepared to deal with life's everyday stuff, man. And if you have done time and you're coming home and you're fresh out, then you need to listen to this too because we need constant reminders because it's real easy for us to forget where we just came from. You stay out of prison for six months, a year, you forget how crazy it was, how hard it was, how many nights you sat there looking out that, that frosted window. Don't forget where you came from. And youngsters, don't forget what I'm telling you. I don't want to see anybody else go to prison because the people don't belong in cages. You get one chance out here, man, to live life one time. You don't get to live, die, live, die, live, die. You get to live and die. Don't die in the cage, man. But getting back to it, we talked about preparation. We talked about uh, the rules of engagement. Now, on the next video, we want to talk about when there is no resolution except one, and that is to go to war. And that will conclude the series. Because once you go to war, it's over. There's only consequence. The only resolution is consequence. And we're going to talk to talk about it. But until then, much love to the Gladiator Gang. Salute. To the blue collar kings, and as always, two wells and a bulletproof arm, man. Stay up, stay out, stay sucker free, y'all.